Hello, everyone. Welcome to the fifth episode of Common Room Talk. My name's Tony, and I'm your host. Now, I know that I started this podcast to have a place to really talk about Harry Potter as well as get better at my public speaking because I'm a teacher inside of my church and I want to get better at my public speaking. And so far, even though we're only five episodes in, I have noticed a difference in the way that I'm talking. I am much more intentional. I'm trying to slow down. I'm trying not to say the uhs and ums, mostly because the part of this that you don't see, which is the editing part, takes forever when you say uh and um all the time. And believe me when I say that what you guys hear in the finished product is so much better than how it sounds now. And so, yeah, so far, this podcast has helped me in the way that I talk. It has helped me in just slowing down. I'm telling you that trying to talk when you have ADHD as bad as I do, and I mean that like literally diagnosed with ADHD, not just self-diagnosed, like was on all kinds of medicine for ADHD. It's not fun. But trying to talk when you have ADHD is a lot more difficult than it sounds. Your brain rushes 15 sentences ahead of where you are and your mouth is just flying to keep up. And especially when I get excited, I just start just vomiting words and my words run together. They get really slurry and my my words are just like falling out on top of each other. And so doing this podcast has actually helped me a lot in just slowing down and being much more intentional about what I'm saying. I'm also trying to just make sure that I'm getting better at my pauses and just where I put them inside of here. And there are a lot of unneeded pauses that I end up trying to edit out. And again, all of this is still new for me. Editing, recording, all of this, brand new, still going through it. YouTube taught, not that great either at it so far. But it is a lot of fun, and I really enjoy the learning process of it. However, with all of that said, the other reason for creating the podcast was to have a place to talk about Harry Potter, and this is exactly what I'm doing, is talking about Harry Potter, and I also want to make sure that I'm doing this in a kid-friendly way. I want it to be a place for kids to come in and listen, and I know that I actually have a few listeners who have started going through the series with their kids and have actually been listening to this podcast with their kids, which to me is really exciting. And you probably hear my puppy here laying next to me for some reason just has her nose against the wall and is just breathing as loud as possible against it. No idea why. And so, yeah, I think it's actually really exciting to have people from many different generations being interested in Harry Potter and having the opportunity to talk about it and have them also listen to it is just... I don't know, it's it's really exciting to me. But something I wanted to share with you guys, which was really, really cool for me, was this. I had a conversation with my mom earlier this week, and she told me that she was proud of me. The last time I heard that was when I was married, so that's twice now in my life that I have heard from my mom that she was proud of me. So it turns out the only things I had to do was get married and then start a podcast. And so I guess I really don't need to make any more episodes. That was it. That's all I was shooting for, uh, to make my mom proud. And now that I've accomplished that, I guess I can just uh, be finished. I can wrap it up. So have a great day, guys. Thank you for listening to Common Room Talk. That's a joke, by the way. Probably poorly executed. I'm not really good at jokes. However, today we're going to be getting into our next chapter, which is The Keeper of the Keys. This is chapter four of the first book, The Sorcerer's Stone. And to recap the first few episodes, we started off with Harry being left on his family's doorstep as a baby. Ten years go by, we see Harry has had a very rough time with his aunt, uncle, and cousin. He is treated like dirt. He's stuffed away in a cupboard under the stairs. On his cousin Dudley's birthday, they went to the zoo. Harry ends up talking to a snake in the reptile house. Dudley sees the snake kind of just like sitting up, interacting with Harry, and rushes over and punches Harry in the in like the ribs, the gut, the stomach, wherever. Harry falls over, and then we see Harry, he looks up, he's angry, and he in his anger, he actually causes the glass to disappear by 
using accidental magic. The snake then escapes, and for all we know, just simply disappears forever and ever, even though I still think it would be really cool if that snake ended up being Nagini. Harry is then punished by being locked up for probably over a month in his cupboard. Then, after being let out, letters start showing up for Harry. It's just one at first, and then hundreds when his Aunt Petunia and Uncle Vernon start to ignore them and keep them from Harry. The sheer amount of the letters eventually just causes them to be rushed from the house. They leave in a panic. Uncle Vernon drives all over the place to eventually just end up on this giant rock in the middle of the ocean. It's off the coast. It's storming. It's just gross outside. They have to take a little rowboat to get over there, and they're staying in this little dilapidated house in their attempt to escape the letters and whoever is sending them. And then we ended last week's episode with this countdown to midnight, which is also Harry's birthday. And at the end of the countdown, we hear, boom, there is just this huge knock at the door. Now, in the movies, we see the the countdown where Harry's looking over at Dudley's watch as his arm's kind of hanging off the couch. And he uh, very pathetically but, like, adoringly kind of just draws this – adoringly – adorably draws this little birthday cake in the dirt, draws the little candles. And Dudley's watch goes off and Harry says, make a wish, Harry, and he blows the dirt away. And as soon as he blows it away, we get the the banging on the door, the boom, and the kind of just shakes the whole hut. It rattles the, the frame of the door. And then here in the book – there's a second huge knock. Boom. It says this one actually woke Dudley up because for some odd reason, the first one didn't wake him up. And he sits up bolt upright and says, where's the cannon? Then it says that Vernon comes skidding into the room holding his rifle. This is what we had seen that was inside of this brown long package that he had in the last chapter. In the movie, him and Petunia kind of just creep down the stairs and he's white knuckling this this rifle as he's standing there and he just, just very scared, barely audible, says, who's there? And then we just see the doors crashed on again and it comes off its hinges. It's hit so hard it falls off the hinges and falls to the ground. And so we see just this giant of a man is standing in the doorway. Obviously, we know it's Hagrid. He's already been described to us in the first chapter. The description here is exactly the same. This long mane of hair, this long beard that's kind of tangled in, and it's only really his eyes that are visible through all of this hair. We already know what it is. And in the the illustrated version of the first book, which is what I'm using, illustrated by Jim K, you have this... Really, it's a full-page portrait of Hagrid who's kind of just squeezing his way into the building here. His head's up against the ceiling. Just, It's a really dark picture, but you get this really cool just feeling from Hagrid of being a giant. And he's wearing this huge overcoat, and he has this, like, it's like an ascot, maybe supposed to be a tie. It kind of looks like a napkin that's tucked into his shirt that has, like, skulls and crossbones on it. And... There's buttons, like little pins on his shirt, and he has this huge belt buckle that looks like it has a a snake as – maybe it's a snake. I can't really tell, but it looks like the head of the snake is what goes through the belt loop and holds it in place. And it's just a really cool little portrait – not little. It's a huge portrait, honestly, of Hagrid. It really just shows his size as he's cramped into this room. And contrasted with what we see in the movie where he bashes down the door and he kind of squeezes his way in, which if you didn't know, they actually have two actors who portray Hagrid in the movies. First is Robbie Coltrane, which I first originally met in one of the James Bond movies and obviously fell in love with him here in the first movie. He plays the almost every single scene Hagrid that we have. However, he wasn't really tall enough to portray the giant size of Hagrid the way that we know that he is in the books. So they had another gentleman named Martin Bayfield who was six feet, 10 inches tall. And he used to be a rugby player. So he's already a good sized dude, but he would stand in in the very far away shots to kind of just show the size difference between Hagrid and everyone else. 
And if you pay attention close enough, you can see the the differences in the face. They do a good job of covering him up, but you can just kind of tell that he was there. And something that I actually recently found out was that Robin Williams, who is by far one of my, well, not one of my, he is my absolute favorite actor. He was one of the people that like, you see these posts on social media that'll say, what was one Hollywood death that really affected you? Robin Williams was mine. I I really, I, I cried the day that I found out that he died. Uh, when I was a kid, I actually wrote him a letter asking him if he would be my dad. Sent it in the mail, no idea where it went. Anyways, he actually tried to play the part of Hagrid, which was really cool to find out. However, J.K. Rowling apparently had this rule where it was only going to be a British-only cast, and so I'm sure Robin Williams would have made an amazing Hagrid, but I, it's hard to see anybody doing it better than Robbie Coltrane did. And yeah, we, we have our Hagrids, and so in the book here, we see Hagrid come in, and his first words in here is, couldn't make us a cup of tea, could you? It's been a long journey, and so his mind's first right there on tea. In the movie, he says, sorry about that after breaking down the door. And he turns around and just picks it up, puts it back in the frame itself. And the reason I am kind of focusing a little more on both the movie and the books is because this part is actually, I think, really important and pivotal in the whole story. And there are quite a few differences and also some really good similarities between the two. And so I am going to focus a little heavier today on comparing the movies and the books just for this little bit here. And so speaking of some of the similarities, here you see in the book where he looks at Dudley, says, budge up, you great lump. And Dudley kind of squeaked and ran behind his mother who was crouching terrified behind Uncle Vernon. Then in the movie... When he first addresses Dudley, thinking it's Harry, he first comments also on Dudley's weight. And so it's just weird. The, the similarity between the, the books and the movie here is both the initial contact uh, being about his weight. But one difference is in the movie, he thinks that Dudley is Harry. However, in the book, he immediately recognizes Harry for who he is. And so, yeah, it's really cool. In, this, in the book here... We have a really cool little portrait. It's only about a quarter of the page. And it's Hagrid, who's this just big, massive man sitting on this, what would be a normal-sized couch, but it's just dwarfed underneath Hagrid. And Harry's kind of just sitting there, like holding his knees to his chest, looking up at Hagrid as Hagrid's looking down at him. And there's a fire then behind them. So as he's looking down at Harry, he says, Last time I saw you, you was only a baby. And then we get the first comparison of Harry to his dad and mom he says you look a lot like your dad but you got your mom's eyes and it says that Uncle Vernon here is making a funny rasping noise by this time in the movie Vernon has already told Hagrid to get out which still they don't know who it is he hasn't introduced himself in the movie or the book at this point but the line that they have is the same for Vernon I demand that you leave at once sir you are breaking and entering and in both instances Hagrid has a response, but one is different in the book than the movie. In the book, he says, shut up, Dursley, you great prune. In the movie, he says, dry up, Dursley, you great prune. Then we see that Hagrid actually takes the rifle from Vernon in the book. He takes it and ties it in a knot as if it was just made out of rubber and then threw it in the corner of the room. In the movie, he just grabs it by the barrel, bends it up. Uncle Vernon shoots and it blasts a hole through the ceiling, which we know wouldn't happen, but I'm not going to sit here and argue logics in a movie based on magic. Hagrid then turns to Harry, wishes him a very happy birthday, and says he's got something for him. We get the, the great like Hagrid accent here, and it, it's iconic because it also plays over to the movies really well. And he pulls out this birthday cake. In the book, his, everything's spelled correctly. Uh, it says, Happy Birthday, Harry. In the movie, we see it kind of misspelled a little bit. And this is when Harry looks up to him and says, Who are you? And this is when we get his full name, Rubeus Hagrid, and his title, Keeper of Keys and Grounds at Hogwarts. He is the Games Keeper. And then it says, He held out his hand and shook Harry's entire arm. 
And one of the things that we see prevalent throughout the entire series about Hagrid is his liking of alcohol. And we see it for the first time right here when he says, what about that tea then, A? He said, rubbing his hands together, I'd not say no to something stronger if you've got it, mind. So he is definitely one for the alcohol. And this is another big difference that we get here. In the movie, Hagrid pulls out his umbrella, shoots two little fireballs at the fireplace, and the fire erupts. In the book, it's much more secretive. It says, his eyes fell on the empty grate with the shriveled crisp packets in it, and he snorted. He bent down over the fireplace. They couldn't see what he was doing. But when he drew back a second later, there was a roaring fire there. And so the book's a little more secretive on, on what's going on. The movie is a little more just out there with it. They they are not afraid to just start jumping into the magic. Hagrid sits down on the couch. He starts pulling a bunch of stuff out of his coat, a copper kettle, a squashy package of sausages, a poker, a teapot, several chipped mugs, and a bottle of some amber liquid, which he took a swig from before starting to make some tea. And he starts just cooking sausages right there on the fire. And it seems that Dudley gets a little fidgety around it. He He's liking what he's smelling. Uncle Vernon cautions him not to touch anything he gives you. And then you see Hagrid chuckling. And he says, your great pudding of a son don't need fattening anymore, Dursley. Don't worry. So he doesn't plan on sharing any of his stuff with Dudley. In the movie, we see the cake. And, and that's kind of, if you're paying attention in the background... As Hagrid and Harry are having their exchange, Dudley kind of just comes up and takes the cake and starts eating it behind their back. But something I want to point out, which is really cool to me, is not only Hagrid's excitement right off the bat to actually getting to finally meet Harry now at an age where he knows what's happening. You see how much he already cares. He's such a caring person, not just for people, but for creatures, which we find out later on in this book and later on in the series. But Hagrid has this cake for him. He's there just ready to give it to him before he even introduces himself. He cares about Harry already, and he's excited to be there and to see him and just to be there with him on his birthday and to deliver this letter, which he's going to give him. And I'm getting ahead of myself but it's just, it's wonderful to see this immediate care. So yeah, Hagrid introduces himself, keeper of keys and grounds at Hogwarts. And he says, yeah, you'll know all about Hogwarts, of course. And that's what he says in the movie as well. Harry here then says no. And Hagrid just looks shocked. Harry then apologizes. And then Hagrid says, sorry, what are you like? Why are you apologizing? Hagrid then turns to stare at the Dursleys. And he says, I knew you weren't getting your letters, but I never thought you wouldn't know about Hogwarts. Did you ever wonder where your parents learned it all? Which this is what he says in the movies. Didn't you ever wonder where your parents learned it all? Harry replies, learned what? And then you get the iconic, you're a wizard, Harry. And that was a terrible Hagrid impression. Now in the books, Hagrid gets a little more animated when Harry asks all what, Hagrid thundered, all what, now wait just one second. And it says he leapt to his feet, and in his anger, he seemed to fill the whole hut, and the Dursleys were cowering against a wall. And so, yeah, you see Hagrid getting worked up. He turns over towards Dursleys and trying to figure out why he doesn't know anything about the wizarding world. And it says that Uncle Vernon, who had gone very pale, whispered something that sounded like mimble wimble or like, which is just something that means like nonsense or boulder dash or cod's wallop, which are other words that Hagrid likes to use. Hagrid then turns back to Harry says, but you must know about your mom and dad. I mean, they're famous. You're famous. Harry replies with what? My mom and dad weren't famous. And Hagrid said, you don't know. You don't know. And he ran his fingers through his hair, fixing Harry with a bewildered, stare and you can kind of just see he's probably getting this deranged crazy look he's running his massive hands through this mangle of hair and he is just completely at a loss as to why harry doesn't know what's going on and already by now in the movie he said you're a wizard to harry that hasn't happened yet in the book because we see here uncle vernon suddenly finds his voice and he says stop i command you stop right there i forbid you to tell the boy anything 
And Hagrid then turns to look at Vernon and asks, you never told him, you never told him what he was in the letter. I was there, I saw Dumbledore leave it, Dursley, and you've kept it from him all these years. Harry asks, what did you keep from me? Uncle Vernon yells again, stop, I forbid you. Vernon is in a panic. Petunia kind of has this little gasp of horror. And Hagrid looks at him and says, go boil your heads, both of you. Turns to Harry and says, Harry, you're a wizard. And then there was silence in the hut. Only the sea and the whistling of the wind could be heard. And then this is where we see Harry say, I'm a what? A wizard. Hagrid then continues. He says, a thumping good one, I'd wager, once you've been trained up a bit. With a mom and dad like yours, what else would you be? I reckon it's about time you read your letter. And so he hands Harry the letter that has been trying to get to him for a few days, uh, if not more than a few days now. And this is what the letter says hogwarts school of witchcraft and wizardry headmaster albus dumbledore order of merlin first class grand sorcerer chief warlock supreme mugwump international confederation of wizards dear mr potter we are pleased to inform you that you have a place at hogwarts school of witchcraft and wizardry please find enclosed a list of all necessary books and equipment term begins on the first of september we await your owl by no later than 31 July. Yours sincerely, Minerva McGonagall, Deputy Headmistress. And so after a few minutes, he then stammered, What does it mean they await my owl? Hagrid then says that reminds him. He pulls out an owl from inside of his coat, writes a letter to Dumbledore on it saying that he's got Harry, and he's going to go take him to buy his things tomorrow. Weather's well, or sorry, weather's horrible. Hope you're well, Hagrid. And he rolls the note up, gives it to the owl, sends him on his way. And you have this little portrait of this tiny little owl holding a letter in his beak. And his eyes are kind of like half shut. And you can tell he's just really unamused from probably spending all that time in Hagrid's coat. Hagrid then goes on to continue what he was saying. And then Uncle Vernon, still ashen-faced but looking very angry, moved into the firelight, says, He's not going. Hagrid grunted and says, I'd like to see a great muggle like you try. Harry asks, a what? And then Hagrid then repeats, a muggle, as we first hear learn what muggles are. It's what you call non-magic folk like them. And it's your bad luck that you grew up in a family of the biggest muggles I ever laid eyes on. That's what Hagrid says. And then Vernon comes in and says, we swore when we took him in, we'd put a stop to all of that rubbish. He says, we swore that we would stamp it out of him. Wizard indeed. And this is kind of unique here that you see Uncle Vernon using these words where he says wizard and there's a few other things that he says that you wouldn't really see him say. Because we see later on in the series that anything that has to do with the magical world, Uncle Vernon's against it. He doesn't even like the words being said in his house. And we're going to talk about that here in just a second. But Harry looked over at them, said, you knew, you knew I'm a, a wizard. And Petunia then speaks up, knew, knew, of course we knew. How could you not be my dratted sister being what she was? Oh, she got a letter just like that and disappeared off to that, that school and came home every holiday with her pockets full of frog spawn, turning teacups into rats. I was the only one who saw her for what she was, a freak which we then also get that in the movie, seeing Petunia kind of stroll over to Vernon. And she says, I saw her for what she was, a freak. And she continues, but for my mother and father, oh no, it was Lily this and Lily that. They were proud of having a witch in the family. And so we're starting to see where this resentment is coming from. Obviously, we know that Petunia doesn't have these powers or she would have been there. And we see that because of this, she is very bitter and she is still just harboring all of these ill feelings towards her sister. And a lot of it has just been, as we know, the way that Harry's been treated kind of spewed out on him. And I wouldn't say kind of, I would say fully, totally, all of it has been just given to Harry in the worst ways possible. But it said that she stopped to take a breath and then went on ranting. And it seemed that she had been waiting to say this for many years. 
Then she met that potter at school, and they left and got married and had you. And of course, I knew you would be just the same, just as strange, just as abnormal, which we see that is exactly how it's said in the movie as well. And then, if you please, she went and got herself blown up, and we got landed with you. You can just, you can feel this resentment of Harry in there. And it's just sad. At the end of the day, is really just sad that Petunia feels this way, that there's really nothing left that we know of of her sister except for Harry, and this is how she treats him. So again, Petunia says she went and got herself blown up and we got landed with you. Harry had gone very white and as soon as he found his voice, asked, blown up, you told me that they died in a car crash. Haggard gets angry here. He jumps up, causes the Dursleys to fall back into a corner out of fear, and he yells, Car crash? How could a car crash kill Lily and James Potter? It's an outrage, a scandal, which we see that's pretty similar to what he says in the movie, but then he continues on here with something that isn't in the movie. Harry Potter not knowing his own story when every kid in our world knows his name. And so this is where we start to see that that clout around Harry, the celebrity that surrounds him and we kind of have a better picture as to why because we've seen the conversation in the first chapter between Dumbledore and McGonagall that talked about the vanquishing of you know who the celebrations and it being because of Harry in some form and everyone knowing his name and it being better that he grows up away from all of it Harry doesn't know this, and so he asks, but why? What happened? Hagrid looks down at Harry, and it says the anger fades from his face, and he looked anxious, and he goes into not really expecting this, not knowing how much Harry didn't know, and him not thinking he was the right person to tell him. And so he sits down, he tries to start explaining, and he says it starts with you-know-who, and he has difficulty trying to say his name and tell it to Harry, but eventually he finally does. After Harry asks him to spell it, he said, no, I can't spell it. And then he says, Voldemort. Now, in the movies, some time has already passed. So at this point in the movies, they've already left the shack, and I believe that they're sitting at the Leaky Cauldron talking about this. It might not be the Leaky Cauldron, but I'm pretty sure it is, in the movie at least. And they're trying to talk about this. So some time has already passed. Here in the book, they are still sitting in this shack. Hagrid then goes into talking about Voldemort. He says, I'm going to read what it says exactly here. Anyway, this, this wizard, about 20 years ago now, started looking for followers, got them too. Some were afraid. Some just wanted a bit of the power because he was getting himself power. All right. Dark days, Harry. Didn't know who to trust. Didn't dare get friendly with strange wizards or witches. Terrible things happened. He was taken over. Course, some stood up to him, and he killed him. Horribly. One of the only safe places left was Hogwarts. Reckon Dumbledore's the only one you know who was afraid of. Didn't dare try taking the school. Not just then, anyway. And so we get a little bit of a background insight into who Voldemort is. And we know he was an evil wizard. He had a lot of power. He had a following. And whether it was because some people were afraid of him or because they wanted some of the power, he was evil and people were following him. And Hagrid goes on saying that they didn't know who to trust. There was so much confusion. And later on, in the stories, we see what people were doing with the Fidelius charm and just trying to keep themselves hidden. And it kept on saying terrible things happened. And we don't know what kind of terrible things are happening. We get insights later on in the story about just disappearances all the time, people being found dead randomly, dark marks being shot up over people's houses. I'm pretty sure that it might have been Mr. Weasley who talked, I think he was talking to Harry and Ron and Hermione about the dark mark and just the fear of coming home from work and seeing the dark mark above your house and not knowing what you're about to walk into, but what you, knowing what you could expect. And so Hagrid here is talking about these terrible things and how Voldemort was taking over. And some people tried to stand up to him and he just killed them all. And not just killed them all, but it says horribly killed them all. And really the only safe place to be was Hogwarts. 
and we see why is because of Dumbledore. And now we start getting a continued sense of how powerful Dumbledore is. So much so that he was the only person that this really extremely dark wizard feared. Then we get a little more insight into Harry's parents. As Hagrid continues saying, Now your mom and dad were as good a witch and wizard as I ever knew. Head boy and girl at Hogwarts in their day. Now, I don't know if this is just a continuity error here, because we see as Harry kind of talks to Lupin about their past. And again, this is later on in the series. I'm pretty sure by the time we get to it, we'll forget about that we even talked about it here. So it really doesn't matter at this moment, because this is significant where Harry's dad, James, and from my understanding, you have to be a prefect to eventually become a head boy. So I'm wondering how, unless the rules changed, James became head boy when he was never a prefect. Unless that changed after, but Lupin said it wasn't him, or Sirius said it wasn't him or James who got the badge. It was Lupin in hopes that maybe he would wrangle in his friends. But back to the story here about why Voldemort then came after them. Hagrid says that, Suppose the mystery is why you-know-who never tried to get them on his side before, probably knew that they were too close to Dumbledore to want anything to do with the dark side. Maybe he thought he could persuade them. Maybe he just wanted them out of the way. All anyone knows is he turned up in the village where you were all living on Halloween ten years ago. You was just a year old, and he came to your house, and then he couldn't finish what he was saying. He blew his nose in a handkerchief, and... He says, sorry, but it's that sad. Knew your mom and dad and nicer people you couldn't find. Anyway, you know who killed him and then this is the real mystery of the thing. He tried to kill you too. Wanted to make a clean job of it, I suppose. Or maybe he just liked killing by then, but he couldn't do it. And so we start to see this mystery unfolding. Why did this dark wizard want to come after Lily and James Potter, and their son. And obviously, if you have been through the series, you have a more detailed picture if you've been through the books, but the movies do an adequate job of explaining it. We know why he comes after them. We're not going to talk about that now. But you start to see here that there was a reason, and people don't really know why. There is one person who knows, well, technically three, but we know that Dumbledore knows, and not really a bunch of other people. It is a mystery, and so you see a lot of guesswork happening as Hagrid's talking about maybe he thought he couldn't persuade them and that's why he wanted to kill them and then wanted to kill Harry just to make a clean job of it. And maybe he just liked killing by then, and they really don't have a good idea as to why. And Hagrid then continues, but he couldn't do it. Never wondered how you got that mark on your forehead that was no ordinary cut. That's what you get when a powerful, evil curse touches you. And I wonder why. Maybe it's just because it didn't kill him and it had to manifest in one way. Or maybe that wasn't just the curse itself leaving a mark. But maybe as we find out later what happens inside of that transaction, what happens to Harry ultimately that ends up saving his life in the end of the story Maybe that's where that mark comes from because any other time that we see the killing curse being used on people, it says that they look 100% healthy other than the fact that they're dead. There's no visible mark on them. So maybe the, the mark on Harry's forehead is a mark left over from what actually happens between him and Voldemort without spoiling it yet. But I don't know, it's something really cool to ponder. Like, why is there a mark in this instance? Is it simply just because it it didn't actually kill Harry? Or is it something else entirely? Hagrid still continues, Harry, no one ever lived after he decided to kill them. No one except you. And he killed some of the best witches and wizards of the age. The McKinnons, the Bones, and the Pruitts. And you was only a baby and you lived. And something that is significant about that, and I think this is really funny, you hear later on in the second story, I believe it's Ernie McMillan that, I'm going to have to open up the book and check. Uh, I believe it's Ernie McMillan who is kind of talking to a group of students under his breath about Harry being the heir of Slytherin. 
and they're talking about how he was only a baby at the time that Voldemort tried to kill him. And his guess was that Voldemort knew that Harry might be an evil wizard and wanted to get him out of the way before he could grow up and be a threat to him. And it's funny because Ernie's partly correct in the fact that he would grow up and be a threat to Voldemort. But it's just funny to see the speculations uh, of some of the people uh, of these kids and why they thought that Harry survived as a baby. Hagrid finishes up his story saying that he's the one who pulled Harry out of the rubble and brought him to the Dursleys, which again, I brought up the fact of the time lapse that seems to just doesn't, it doesn't make any sense on how an entire day passed before Hagrid got Harry to the Dursleys after his parents were killed. But Uncle Vernon finally speaks up again, says, load of old Tosh. Harry jumped and he almost had forgotten that the Dursleys were there. He's so caught up in this story. And he was glaring at Hagrid and his fists were clenched. That's Uncle Vernon, by the way. His fists were clenched. And he says, now listen here, boy, he snarled. I accept there's something strange about you. Probably nothing a good beating wouldn't have cured. And this is where you really see that similarity between him and Marge later on in the story. They both have this mindset. And it kind of also makes me wonder how Aunt Marge and Vernon grew up if they believed that beating a kid would be able to instill the habits and nature that they want. And obviously, it's a different generation. That's a time when they did believe that physical punishment like that was the way to go. Vernon continues on, and as for all of this about your parents, well, they were weirdos, no denying it, and the world's better off without them, in my opinion. Asked for all they got, getting mixed up with these wizarding types, just what I expected, always knew they would come to a sticky end. That's very Lucius Malfoy of Vernon, coming to a sticky end. That's the way that Lucius likes to talk. But this is absolutely deplorable the way that vernon talks about harry's dead parents i wish that hagrid would have just punched him in the face right there just done something to him to shut him up because that's not okay that is terrible but there is also reason as to why and i'm going to talk about this just a little bit so over on the pottermore website which you if you haven't been to pottermore go check it out it is really cool they have a lot of backstories here all done by jk rowling And this one in particular is about Vernon and Petunia. And I think this is really cool. I'm going to read this to you. This is what it says. It's kind of lengthy, but it is really good. Harry's aunt and uncle met at work. Petunia Evans, forever embittered by the fact that her parents seemed to value her sister, which more than they valued her. She left Cokeworth forever to pursue a typing course in London. This led to an office job where she met the extremely unmagical, opinionated and materialistic Vernon Dursley. Large and necklace, this junior executive seemed a model of manliness to young Petunia. He not only returned her romantic interest, but was deliciously normal. He had a perfectly correct car and wanted to do completely ordinary things. And by the time he had taken her on a series of dull dates during which he talked mainly about himself and his predictable ideas on the world, Petunia was dreaming of the moment when he would place a ring on her finger. When, in due course, Vernon Dursley proposed marriage, very correctly, on one knee in his mother's sitting room, Petunia accepted at once. The one fly in her delicious ointment was the fear of what her new fiancé would make of her sister, who was now in her final year at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Vernon was apt to despise even people who wore brown shoes with black suits. You shouldn't ever do that, by the way. Don't wear brown shoes with a black suit. It doesn't look great. So I agree with Vernon on that one. However, what he would make of a young woman who spent most of her time wearing long robes and casting spells, Petunia could hardly bear to think. She confessed the truth during a tear-stained date in Vernon's dark car as they sat overlooking the chip shop where Vernon had just bought them a post-cinema snack. Vernon, as Petunia expected, was deeply shocked. 
However, he told Petunia solemnly that he would never hold it against her that she had a freak for a sister, and Petunia threw herself upon him in such a violent gratitude that he dropped his battered sausage. The first meeting between Lily and her boyfriend James and the engaged couple went badly, and the relationship nosedived from there. James was amused by Vernon and made the mistake of showing it. Vernon tried to patronize James, asking what car he drove. James described his racing broom. Vernon supposed out loud that wizards had to live on unemployment benefit. James explained about Gringotts and the fortune his parents had saved there in solid gold, which I think is kind of another continuity error there since you see later on that Harry believes, or maybe it's not continuity, it's just never brought up, but Harry doesn't think that the Dursleys know about all of the gold that he has in Gringotts. Vernon could not tell whether he was being made fun of or not and grew angry. The evening ended with Vernon and Petunia storming out of the restaurant while Lily burst into tears and James, a little ashamed of himself, promised to make things up with Vernon at the earliest opportunity. This never happened. Petunia did not want Lily as a bridesmaid because she was tired of being overshadowed. Lily was hurt. Vernon refused to speak to James at the reception, but described him with James in earshot as some kind of amateur magician. Once married, Petunia grew ever more like Vernon. She loved their neat square house at number four Privet Drive. She was secure now from objects that behaved strangely, from teapots that suddenly piped tunes as she passed, or long conversations about things she did not understand with names like Quidditch and Transfiguration. She and Vernon chose not to attend Lily and James' wedding. The very last piece of correspondence she received from Lily and James was the announcement of Harry's birth and... After one contemptuous look, Petunia threw it in the bin. The shock of finding their orphan nephew on their doorstep a little over a year later was therefore extreme. The letter that accompanied him related how his parents had been murdered and asked the Dursleys to take him in. It explained that due to the sacrifice Lily made in laying down her life for her son, Harry would be safe from the vengeance of Lord Voldemort as long as he could call the place where her blood still existed home. This meant number four, Privet Drive, as his only sanctuary. And so it goes on talking about the letter, talking about this. And the one thing I wanted to point out inside of this is what it says about Vernon and James. And I think this paragraph here. Even though Petunia was raised alongside a witch, she is remarkably ignorant about magic. She and Vernon share a confused idea that they will somehow be able to squash the magic out of Harry, and in an attempt to throw off the letters that arrive from Hogwarts on Harry's 11th birthday, she and Vernon fall back on the old superstition that witches cannot cross water, as she had frequently seen Lily jump streams and cross stepping stones in their childhood. She ought to not have been surprised when Hagrid had no difficulty making his way to the rock. And you get some more of JK's thoughts here. And one of the things that she talks about why Vernon doesn't like Harry that much is because of how much he looks like James and how much he reminds him of James and everything that happened between them. And he kind of takes all of that aggression out. And when you pile that up with the way that Vernon doesn't like these non-ordinary, non-normal things, he really just does not like Harry. When you put it all together, it is not a good combination for Harry. So Vernon says all of these terrible things about Harry's parents. Hagrid stands up, says he's warning Vernon. He's pointing his umbrella at him. And and it says, in danger of being speared on the end of an umbrella by a bearded giant, Uncle Vernon's courage failed again, and he flattened himself against the wall. And so Harry then turns to Hagrid, asks him about Voldemort. Well, he doesn't actually say his name. He says Vol, but then says, sorry, I mean, you know who. Hagrid explains that he disappeared, doesn't know what's going on. Some thinks that he might have died. Some thinks he went into hiding. And you don't really get a full picture here of like what is going on with Voldemort now because nobody really seems to know. Then you see kind of like this, not inner monologue, but you see into Harry's thoughts about wondering how he could be a wizard and how he could have magic. How is it when he was a baby, if he defeated the, the baddest dark wizard of their time, how is it that he's then being bullied by Dudley in school and just not understanding like 
how he could be this person because of how he's being treated now. So he's still kind of just second guessing being a wizard. And this is where we see Hagrid explain to him, like, you've never made anything happen when he was angry or scared. Harry then reflects on the fact that he did make things happen, like the glass vanishing or ending up on the roof somehow or making his hair grow back when he didn't want to go to school with this terrible looking haircut. And he looks back at Hagrid, who's beaming at him, which we kind of see that happen again at the hut in the movie. Hagrid says, you see... Harry Potter, not a wizard, you wait, you'll be right famous at Hogwarts. And Uncle Vernon steps up again and says, haven't I told you he's not going? He's going to Stonewall High and he'll be grateful for it. I've read those letters and he needs all sorts of rubbish, spell books and wands. And Hagrid stands up, says, if he wants to go, a great muggle like you won't stop him. And that's where I think we see in the movie where muggles first used and Harry asks about it. Then Vernon makes the mistake. He says, I'm not going to pay to have some crackpot old fool teach him magic tricks. And this is where you first see Hagrid's loyalty to Dumbledore. He does not put up with this at all. He stands up, gets ready to do something to Vernon, but then looks over at Dudley and points his umbrella at him. And the book, I don't understand why. Like, Vernon's the one who insulted him. I don't understand why he attacks Dudley. Because Dudley really didn't do anything. And I think this actually might be where the movie probably does a little bit better of a job explaining this. And, and not explaining it, but maybe a better job as to why. Because you, you did see Dudley kind of sneak in, grab Harry's birthday cake, and then in the background, like a little pig, he's eating it. And so this is what happens. Hagrid points his umbrella at Dudley, does something, and a tail, a pig's tail, pops out of Dudley's behind says, Uncle Vernon roared, pulling Aunt Petunia and Dudley into the other room. He cast one terrified look at Hagrid and slammed the door behind them. Hagrid then looks down at his umbrella. He's stroking his beard and says he shouldn't have lost his temper and really asks Harry not to mention it, that he's not really supposed to do magic. Harry asks, why aren't you allowed to do magic? Hagrid says that he was expelled in his third year. Harry asks why... Hagrid changes the subject. And so that's also something we see tie into the next movie, why Hagrid was expelled in his third year. And it's just really cool that it's being set up already. Like this is the beginning of the first book and JK's mind is already setting up the next book. But Hagrid takes off his coat, throws it to Harry and says, you can kip under that. Don't mind if it wiggles. I think I still have a couple of mice in there. Then here in the illustrated book, you have some really good portraits of Hagrid flourishing his little pink umbrella and Dudley's bottom half kind of in the picture. He has these little crocodile slippers that are falling off of his feet and you see the little piggy tail coming out. And then on the very next page, you have another portrait of just the dark, gloomy, stormy sky, the water underneath, the rock in the center, and the little crumbling shack at the very top of it. And so, yeah, that's the end of the fourth chapter. And man, what a chapter. It, it is really cool. You start to see the mystery kind of unraveling here. What is it about Harry that's happening? Why does he make these weird things happen? We start to find out about Hogwarts and we get a little bit of backstory about what happened to him and his parents and why, when you go into Pottermore, why Petunia and Dursley really treat him the way that they do. It is really cool, and I love it. And so, yeah, I want to thank you guys again for listening. Please, if you're enjoying this podcast, share it, like it, talk about it, rate it. Please go into whatever podcast platform you're using and give me a rating so I can know what you guys think. Uh, leave comments. Uh, leave written ratings. I just want to know. Give me feedback too, please. Commonroomtalk at gmail.com. If you guys want a chance to ask questions or anything, I'll read it live here in the podcast and we'll talk about these things. If there's something that I missed or that I messed up, that I misspoke on, let me know. Correct me. I take humility pretty well. I want to know if there is anything. That's, that's how you grow. That's how you, you learn. Uh, you, you get corrected when you're wrong and you own up to it. And I would like to have that chance if I am saying anything wrong. So please let me know if you guys have questions. Again, commonroomtalk at gmail.com. And again, please share this with anyone and everyone. This was a fun episode. I can't thank you guys enough for listening. Again, my name's Tony and this is Common Room Talk.